So welcome to lecture six. The structure theorem of tropical geometry is the second main theorem in chapter three after the uh, fundamental theorem. So let's do a little bit of uh, polyhedral geometry. So sigma is a polyhedral fan in n space, let's say, pure of dimension d. Every maximal cone has dimension d. And let's say it's defined over the rational numbers, but later this might be a, a value group. Let's say we have some weights. We fix weights m of sigma. These are non-negative integers on every cone. And these are going to be all cones of top dimension. So sigma upper d is all the cones. Every cone sigma of top dimension d has some non-negative integer weight chosen arbitrarily for now. Let's consider <coughs> any cone tau of dimension one less, of dimension d minus one, and let's write L for the linear span of tau in the ambient space. So the ambient space is Rn. So L is a vector subspace in R to the n, of dimension d minus one. We're going to be interested in the following abelian group. N of tau. Now this capital N is actually important. So in toric geometry, which we'll get to, it's become, has become customary to use the letters capital M and capital N. Capital M is where the polytopes and the monomials and the characters live. Capital N is where the co-characters live. Capital N is where the tropical variety will ultimately live in the abstract setting of chapter six. But for now, we're just going to define this uh, in coordinates. So it's Zn intersect the sublattice restricted to um, L, right? And so this is a free abelian group of rank n minus d plus one. Okay. So this is torsion free, right? Because we're intersecting an entire subspace L with uh, z to the n, so there's no torsion. So we simply have the quotient of z to the n mod a free abelian subgroup of rank d minus one. So we get the uh, this free abelian group. Now suppose that tau is in sigma. Okay, so tau is dimension d minus one, sigma is dimension d. So then we can look at sigma plus L mod L. Well, what's that? I claim that's a one-dimensional cone. in the aforementioned space, right? So n tau, this n tau, but let's turn it into a vector space by tensoring with r. So this is the associated vector space. So I claim that's just a ray. That's a one-dimensional cone in this r to the n minus d plus one. Okay. So here I have a, a d-dimensional cone plus this L, that's a span of, say, one of its faces, modulo that span, all that's left is a ray, okay? So let's visualize this, right? So suppose I have, uh, this is the top dimension, I'm, I'm somewhere in my fan, right? So let's say this Let's say D is seven, right? So I have some seven dimensional cone. It contains maybe a six dimensional cone, but modulo the six dimensional space, all you see is a ray. But, you know, it happens to live in this space. Now everything is defined over the rational number, so V sigma can be defined to be the first lattice point. on this ray. Right? 
I mean, this real vector space has the structure of a lattice, so we can speak about the first lattice point, right? So array, a one-dimensional array um, in, in ambient vector space that has a lattice structure, has a first lattice point, and this first lattice point is called V sigma. Now comes the important definition. The fan sigma is said to be balanced, is a balanced fan. If the following linear equation holds, I'm summing over all sigma containing a fixed tau, the integer m sigma times v sigma. If this is zero, and this is the zero element in n tau, and this should be true for all cones tau of dimension v minus one. Okay, if that holds, I'm going to say the fan is balanced. So again, I have this eight-dimensional fan in a 20-dimensional space. I look at every seven-dimensional cone, right? Then I fix a seven-dimensional cone. I look at all the eight-dimensional cones containing it. I look at all the eight-dimensional cones containing the seven-dimensional cone. And then the first generators in this lattice direction in the quotient space should add up to zero. That's what it means to be balanced. That's a balanced fan. Let's visualize this for polytopes. So example, <clears throat> let's look at the case where D is n minus one and where sigma is the n minus one skeleton of the normal fan of a lattice polytope. Let's say it's a full dimension lattice polytope in Rn, okay? Well, I have to tell you what the weights are, so I'm going to choose my weights m sigma to be the lattice length of the edge of the polytope dual to sigma, right? So sigma is a co-dimension one cone, the normal fan. So it's the set of all linear functionals that get minimized at some edge. That edge is the line segment between two lattice points. Just, you know, count in between lattice points as a lattice length, right? So if there's two guys in between, it has lattice length three. Okay, and that's a, a positive integer. So I'm going to use that positive integer to assign a weight to this cone sigma. Now I claim balancing holds, right? So let's try to visualize why balancing holds. <clears throat> so let's say, <clears throat> um, let's pick a tau. Right? So here's a tau. Let's say, so this is now a three-dimensional polytope. The normal fan, I'm looking at the two skeleton of the normal fan, okay? So n is three, d is two, d minus one is one. So, so tau is a ray, and this ray is contained in a bunch of two-dimensional cones, so maybe six of them. Right? So this is in the normal fan. Now on the polytope side, this means I have a hexagonal face, right? So somewhere on the polytope, I have a hexagonal face. And then the red ray is the inner normal direction of the, of this yellow facet, okay? And then these two dimensional cones, they are the dual of these edges, these yellow edges, okay? So now I'm looking at the lattice length of each edge, right? I'm counting, you know, the number of lattice points on each edge, right? And now I claim that balancing holds, right? So why does balancing hold? Well, because I can now, I work modulo tau, so I have all these, you know, vectors. But these vectors are just 90 degree rotations of these yellow edges. 
But these are the first lattice points. So if this thing has lattice length 3, I have to scale this, right? So I have to scale them according to the lattice length. But I claim those six red vectors add up to zero after that scaling. That's because the six yellow vectors add up to zero, right? The six yellow vectors add up to zero, right? You go, you go, you go, you go, you go, you close the loop, right? So if you think about these as direction directed vectors, they add up to zero. But these are the same vectors. They're just rotated by 90 degrees, okay? So that's how you see this for a convex polytope and its normal fan. OK, now let's make this a little bit more complicated. So now I've told you uh, what it means to be a balanced fan. Now I need to take this one step further and tell you what a balanced polyhedral complex is. So mind you, there's no algebraic geometry here whatsoever, right? This is just polyhedral combinatorics. I'm just talking about fans, but uh, the only structure is here that I have a lattice floating around. OK, so now let's take a polyhedral complex. So let's say sigma is a rational polyhedral complex in Rn. Defined, everything is defined over the rational numbers. Let's say it's of dimension d and pure. So pure of dimension d, every maximal cell has dimension d. And then for every tau of dimension d minus 1, every co dimension 1 cell, I look at the fan which is the star in sigma of tau. So the star is defined in section 2.3 in polyhedral geometry that I glossed over very fast, right? So if you have a polyhedral complex and you live on one face, on one cell, then the star is the local neighborhood, right? So let's say you live on an edge, then many, many, many other cones and you know, all cells contain you, then working modulo that line, you have a fan of all the neighboring, you see a fan of all the neighboring things um, that contain you, and that's called the star, right? So this star will now be a rational fan, and we can apply the previous condition. The, the star, okay, for every tau, the fan inherits the weights, right? So the Maximal cones here come from maximal faces before, so they keep get the same weight. And I'm going to call sigma balanced. Polyhedral complex is balanced if these fans are all balanced. OK, again, you have an eight-dimensional polyhedral complex in a 20-dimensional space. Every maximal cell, the maximal cells are convex polyhedra, bounded, unbounded, defined over the rational numbers. I'm attaching a positive integer to every such maximal cell. Okay? Now, this may or may not be balanced. To check whether it's balanced, I look at every seven-dimensional face. I look at all the adjacent top dimensional faces. They locally form a fan with that weighting, and I apply the previous definition. Okay? So let's uh, look at an example. So let's take a plane conic. So, as always, a plane conic is dual to the subdivision. So the conic looks like this. Okay? Now I want to argue that this is balanced. Well, first of all, to give it a balancing, I need to assign a positive integer to each red edge. That's the weight of that cell. Well, the weight of this is the lattice length of the corresponding yellow edge. Every co-dimension one, every top dimensional, you know, every top dimensional red cell will be dual to a yellow edge. The yellow edge has a lattice length. Everything is defined over the lattice. That's the weighting. 
So now, what does balancing mean? Well, I take a co-dimension one cone, I take this tau, and now I'm just pay attention to the star of this tau. Well, what's the star? The star is I make tau the origin, and I look at this fan. Now I go from complex to fan. But now these top dimensional cones are just have the same weights they had before, and then this is balanced. Well, balanced means if I take the first lattice point in each direction, I multiply by the weight, they add up to zero. They play a tug of war with rope and nobody wins. Okay. Now let's note, that's our first proposition. <clears throat> so proposition. Three, three, two. For every tropical polynomial, F, the corresponding tropical hypersurface, V of F defined by minimal is attained twice, is a balanced polyhedral complex. Well, how so? Well, the, uh, the weights are simply the lattice length of the associated edges, the yellow edges, in the uh, dual regular subdivision. And then uh, the balancing holds pretty much by the similar argument that I gave, that you have, uh, the argument is simply that the edges, the edge directions around a, a convex polygon, a planar polygon, add up to zero. Okay, we need one more definition to uh, state the structure theorem. So that's definition three, three, four. Suppose you have a polyhedral complex. I want to say it's connected, connected through co-dimension one. If dot, 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 I'm not going to write it down, I'm going to show a picture. Well, if you look at the maximal polyhedra and you glue them together, and maybe it looks like this, right? So here I have a quadrilateral, 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 pentagon, triangle, and that complex is connected in co-dimension one. I can reach every polygon to any other polygon by just traveling over an edge. So this is uh, connected in co-dimension one. But of course, if I start like this, and then I go maybe like this, then it's not connected in co-dimension one, right? That's a polyhedral complex in the plane. It's connected as a set, but it's not connected in co-dimension one because I cannot pass from every top dimensional face to every other top dimensional face by passing along co-dimension one, okay? So, so this is not connected in co-dimension one through co-dimension one. Now tropical hypersurfaces, have this property. Every tropical hypersurface is connected in co-dimension one. Well, let's think for a moment why that is. Well, so I claim if you have any tropical hypersurface, the object dual to a subdivision in yellow, you take any maximal cell here, you can reach any other maximal cell by just traversing, you know, along co-dimension one. And that's because if you take here, right, any edge in the subdivision, then um, there will be a dual connectivity. Maybe here it's easier to see, right? Every edge can be connected to every edge by traveling along two-dimensional faces. So on a polytope, or on a poly polytope polyhedral subdivision of a polytope, if you have an edge, you can reach any other edge by, so the, the move is you take an edge and you can travel to any other edge on a polygon, you know, that has that edge. 
So now you're here, pick a polygon that has that edge, pick another edge, and keep going, and then you can connect any two edges, right? So that's why this is connected in co-dimension one, through co-dimension one. It's always good to think about hypersurfaces, so let me uh, think about quadrics in three space. We'll get to this next week, but uh, quadrics in three space, well, what is the corresponding yellow picture? Well, corresponding yellow picture for a quadric is a standard tetrahedron of side length two, right? So a tetrahedron of side length two, like this, and then the dual object has 24 plus one facets in red, and they are connected in co-dimension one. They're connected through 16 plus eight edges. Now these numbers, of course, are red numbers, so this is in the uh, tropical hypersurface, right? Well, why it's 24 plus one? There are 24 unbounded two-dimensional cells corresponding to the 24 yellow edges on the boundary of such a triangulation. Such a triangulation divides this into eight tetrahedron and there's exactly one yellow edge that sticks to the interior. There's exactly one interior yellow edge. Dual to this interior yellow edge is a bounded cell. So there are 25 cells and you can travel from each of these 25 cells to every other red 25 dimensional cells through co-dimension one, through red edges. Well, the red edges are dual to uh, yellow triangles. There are 16, I hope I get this right now. There are 16 triangles on the boundary corresponding to red rays, unbounded one cells, and then there are eight, uh, in the interior, um, so there are eight triangles cutting through the interior. They correspond to bounded red edges, okay? So, so I encourage you, I in fact strongly encourage you to start drawing three-dimensional pictures. Here's the structure theorem. Structure theorem for tropical varieties. Second main theorem in chapter three. And this is three, three, five in the book. It says the following, so same hypothesis, K is an algebraically closed field with evaluation. Um, we may not need that it's non-trivial, I think, but let's assume it. Um, so X is an irreducible variety, irreducible d-dimensional variety in the torus. Then we have its tropicalization. And we know from the fundamental theorem, the tropicalization is either the image of the classical variety under the valuation map, or it's given in the Grobnerian sense as the set of all weight vectors, the initial ideal of which contains no monomial. So it's tropicalization, trop x is the support of a balanced weighted gamma val rational polyhedral complex. This complex is pure of dimension D 
and it is also connected through co-dimension one. So that is the structure thing. So you have a classical variety, and all I need is irreducible, right? Then you look at the corresponding, or I guess I do need, I'm sorry, yeah. So in this definition, let, let's, let's say the, the valuation is non trivial. So then there's a corresponding tropical variety, which is the image under the valuation map. Then this image, which some set is a polyhedral complex. It is pure d-dimensional. Each maximal cell has the correct dimension. It inherits the correct dimension. It has a weighting. I'll tell you later what this weighting is. And that weighting makes it a balanced complex. Everywhere locally, the tug of war has no winner. And it's connected through co-dimension one. Okay? So all of these things are true. Now, the Co connected through co-dimension one is very, very nice for algorithms. So algorithms for constructing tro tropical varieties rely on connected through co-dimension one. And the idea is that you somehow get a first red d-dimensional cell, and then you can visit every other cell by making a local move along a facet of that red cell. Right? So you are at some red cell. You get all the facets of this cell, then you flip over, you know, along locally a book of, you know, you go from page to page locally in that book, and in that way you can visit, you can find every other cell. So this is, uh, this connected through co-dimension one uh, is very important for algorithms. Let me say a word about the dimension statement. This is always quite amazing. So, Students who learn about dimension in commutative algebra or algebraic geometry for the first time are often puzzled by the definitions, right? So there are all these definitions involving the Hilbert polynomial or, you know, chains of prime ideals and Kroll dimension. There are all these definitions of dimension. And it can be painful to prove that they're all equivalent. And in fact, even more so, let's say for people interested in topology or topological data, this, these are non-intuitive notions of definition, of definition of dimension, okay? So suppose you are a graduate student and you did not like any of the definitions of dimension that you saw in your course on commutative algebra or algebraic geometry, here's a new definition. Indeed, you can take this as a definition of dimension of an irreducible variety, right? You have an irreducible variety. All you need to do is draw the tropical picture. The tropical picture is locally linear, and for a linear space, you know the dimension. So if you didn't like Kroll dimension, Hilbert polynomial, chains of primes, here is a definition of dimension for you. Let me not use this board right now because I don't want to eclipse the uh, structure theorem. <clears throat> Let me make a few remarks about the proof of the various ingredients in the structure theorem. Okay, so proof structure. Proof structure of the structure theorem. Well, so there are a bunch of theorems that get used, and they are developed over three sections. So the, the main theorem that make up this proof is 338, 3414, and 351. Those are the main points, and then aggregating them all together gives you this theorem. So 338 is gamma of L rational and pure d dimension, pure of dimension d. Okay? The first thing that you prove is uh, that this, everything is defined over the rationals, where the rationals refer to the value group. 
and then the top dimensional cells have the correct dimension. Again, there will be some kind of a slicing argument, right? So you have to go down in dimension. So you first prove this in dimension D. Well, in dimension D, there isn't much to say, right? Everything is points. But then you take a higher dimensional situation and you cut the classical variety by a toric hypersurface. Monomial equals monomial. The tropicalization of a toric hypersurface is a linear space. So on the tropical side, you cut with the linear space. Right? Then you work your way down, you keep cutting with the tropical hyper, with classical hypersurfaces or, tr or linear spaces on the tropical side. Then uh, you need a kind of a version, an appropriate version of Patini's theorem, and you get, get down, and that's theorem 338. In 3.4, we need to address the issue of balancing. So just showing that it's balanced is more or less a whole section. And part of the question, which I'll say a word about, is what are even the weights? Right? So I haven't told you yet what the weights are in general. I gave you a hint in the hypersurface case. I talked about lattice length of red edges, but I have not given you the weights. Right? So, so I need to define. So here it just says there exists a natural choice of weights that makes it balanced, but I haven't told you yet what they are. So I need to tell you what they are, and then I need to prove balancing. Right. And balancing we defined first for fans, and then by way of stars for arbitrary complexes. And then 3.5 is the connectivity state, connected through co-dimension one. And that is the hardest part. That's actually hard, and we were not able to do it. So, we did not succeed. We tried for a long time, that is to say Diane tried for a very long time. We consulted with friends to give a self-contained elementary proof. So the premise of this book is students can understand these proofs if they understand Cox and Locher. We were, this, this we succeeded. I think we, it's complicated, but it can be understood. This we did not succeed. So we had to uh, refer to uh, connectivity theorems and algebraic geometry. So we, we really had to use uh, uh, non-trivial results from, from algebraic geometry to get connectivity through co-dimension one. And there are some elementary to state uh, instances of this that we don't, that we, that are hard, that are purely combinatorial. It's, it's related maybe for some of you of interest to some of the work that Jun Ha has been involved in. So if this connectivity in co-dimension one through co-dimension one is a non-trivial fact. Okay. Now, Together with the structure theorem, there's a question about the converse. Let me call this the realizability problem. This raises a converse question. Given such a complex, right? So Suppose I give you a sigma that satisfies all of these conditions, right? I'm giving you a complex that's pure d-dimensional in R to the n, and have weights, and is connected in co-dimension one, that satisfies all the conclusions over here. Is there a variety? Is there always a classical variety x in t to the n over some field? Some fi see, it's over some field of some characteristic, is there some field and some variety over the n-dimensional torus which tropicalizes to the given complex? Right. So here we're saying that all of these things hold for tropical varieties, they're necessary conditions, but is this a sufficient condition? And the answer is, well, yes and no. So it's yes in co-dimension one. So if D is N minus one, then by proposition three, three, 10, the answer is yes. For hypersurfaces, the answer is yes. In general, the answer is no. Okay, the answer is no in general. So the, the known counterexamples, the, the most basic known counterexamples come in two flavors. So 
There are already counterexamples for curves in three space. You can have a balanced, nice, you know, tropical graph in three dimensional space that does not come from, uh, that, that does not come from a classical curve. So it violates some kind of inequality on Riemann surfaces. So you have Riemann surfaces or algebraic curves. They satisfy various things. And you can make graphs in three space that violate these things. Okay? That's the one nature of the counterexample. But the better counterexamples are linear spaces. So in the context of linear spaces, this is exactly a shadow of realizability of matroids. Right? So so tropical varieties, in the linear case, are pretty much matroids, or at least evaluated matroids. And they may or may not be realizable over some field. And some matroids are not realizable over any field. And then the corresponding linear spaces are just have no corresponding variety. Right? So this is really a shadow in the linear case. So in some sense, this is a nonlinear theory of uh, realizability of, of matroids. That is why. We will distinguish between tropical linear spaces and tropicalized linear spaces. Okay? A tropicalized linear space is trop x, where x is a classical linear space. A tropical linear space is a sigma that looks like it, that satisfies all the conclusions, but may not actually come from a linear space x. Okay? So that's the realizability problem. So let me talk a little bit about uh, section 3.4. So I'm going to concentrate now on what are the weights and how should we think about balancing. Okay? So multiplicities and balancing. So the basic object we start with is an ideal. An ideal. Okay. As I said, the aim for the algebraic parts in this book was that all proofs are understandable if you know Cox Loche. You do not need uh, you know, significant background in, in commutative algebra or algebraic geometry, but it helps. Okay? So let's start with an ideal in a raw polynomial ring. Um, and let's look at some initial ideal in W of i. So this is also in the raw polynomial ring, but now over the little field or the residue field. And there were many such initial ideals, you know, one for each cell in the Grobner complex. So let's look at the Grobner complex. So let sigma be the Grobner complex structure. On the tropical variety. Now, here's a very important point about the structure theorem. A, a very important word in this sentence is the word uh. Uh, balanced, weighted, blah, blah, blah. The indefinite article uh is very important. It says there exists some structure of a polyhedral complex on this set. But it's not unique. There's no the. There's no definite article. There's an uh. Okay, let me circle this. This is a, an important word in the sentence is the word uh. Okay. In fact, this complex is not unique. Right? So if you give me a tropical variety, so for example, this tropical variety might have locally, you know, two triangles intersecting in a common point in the interior. Such a structure does not have a canonical coarsest subdivision. 
So if you have a polyhedral space, in general, there is no coarsest subdivision. You would like it to be. In low dimensional cases, in nice cases, there is. But in general, there is not. Right? So I'm saying there is. So you have this polyhedral space. It's balanced. It has all these properties. There is no coarsest subdivision. Okay. So therefore, what you often do is you work with the Gröbner complex subdivision. So this is induced by the closure and projective space. So you homogenize your Laurent polynomial ideal. You pass to the homogeneous ideal. You calculate the entire Gröbner complex with one million cells. And out of those one million cells, only 587 are monomial free. They make up the tropical variety. But now the tropical variety comes with a polyhedral complex structure, namely that from the ambient Gröbner complex. Okay, so let's look at the Gröbner complex. Um, and let's pick a top dimensional cell. So sigma is now a d dimensional cell. And let's pick any w in its relative interior up in n space, and all those w's, it doesn't matter, all those w's will have the same initial ideal. That's the definition of Gröbner complex. So now we need to define the multiplicity. Maybe we'll do this here. Okay, so now I need to define m sigma. So m sigma is a non-negative integer. Right? So I promised there's weights on these top dimensional cones and I'm now going to define the weight and the weight will be computed from this ideal in this ring. And in that computation you're going to work over the residue field. And here's the definition. It's the sum over all minimal associated primes of this initial ideal. And you're summing the multiplicity of that prime, of that associated prime in the ideal. Okay. So it's a bunch of integers read off from the primary decomposition of that initial ideal which is a very good moment to go to INLA, Invitation to Nonlinear Algebra, and review the chapter on primary decomposition. If you have an ideal in a polynomial ring, then, uh, you know, there's associated primes. They come in two flavors. They're minimal primes and they're embedded primes. Here we're only concentrating on the minimal primes. In this context, it turns out that all minimal primes have the same height. They have the same dimension. And there is a notion of multiplicity, okay? And this, I need to uh, tell you what it is, right? So there's this notion of multiplicity. <clears throat> and there's two ways to think about this. Well, there are many ways to think about this, that this is the length of a certain local ring. So if you're trained in classical commutative algebra, Encountered commutative algebra, say, through uh, Tia McDonald, then you like local rings. A lot of mathematicians like local rings. So, uh, so you take uh, the raw polynomial ring, you mod by Q, and I have to tell you what's Q. So I guess this here is Q. Right? So I want the multiplicity of P in Q. It's the length. This quotient localized at P, okay? So this is a zero-dimensional local ring. It has a length, and that length is the multiplicity, okay? So for those who like local rings, that's a perfectly good definition. Ah, so where Q, I'm sorry, where Q, where? I misspoke, where Q is the, sorry, correction, is the P, primary component of the initial ideal. Sorry, sorry. Okay, go back. So 
The definite article the reminds us that the primary component corresponding to a minimal prime is unique. Right? So in primary decomposition, the embedded primes do not have unique primary components, but the minimal primes have unique primary components. So Q is the unique P primary component of this initial ideal, and now what I said makes sense. So it's the length of this local ring. Okay. Now, I don't like local rings very much from the computational point of view. They tend to be really non-Noetherian, sort of, right? So local rings are sort of nasty from a computing point of view. They're very sneaky and good from the proving point of view. But uh, therefore, it pays to do the following exercise. <clears throat> Thirty-four in this chapter is how to compute this multiplicity in a computer algebra system such as Macaulay II. Okay? It's actually quite easy. It's the quotient of two degrees. So what you need to do is you make P, you make Q, you apply degree. Degree of P is a positive integer. Degree of Q is a positive integer. The second is a multiple of the first. Take the ratio, that's the multiplicity, okay? So that's a definition I like better. It's an operational definition, and that's equivalent to this length. Well, another exercise is 12. I'm gonna paraphrase this. It's not stated like this, but Basically, we're asking to review the, uh, primary decomposition. Now, there are many sources for this, but one possible source is invitation to nonlinear algebra. Okay. So summing up a little bit of commutative algebra, the structure of associated primes, their primary components, and so on, that helps us, that gives us the weights. And then uh, based on this, we need to, we can actually prove balancing, okay? Balancing um, in, for curves is particularly nice. It's equivalent to uh, the residue theorem. So some people think of this as the residue theorem, but from the perspective of our book, it is more natural to take an algebraic point of view and, and use this definition of multiplicities and has the great merit that it works in complete generality. So you don't need to have hypersurfaces or complete intersections or anything. Okay, so that's it. So we covered today the two main theorems in chapter three that are central to the theory, the fundamental theorem and the structure theorem, and I invite further questions. So if you have a non-regular uh, subdivision or non-regular triangulation, then there will be an abstract dual but there will be no realization in this sort of perpendicular manner that you want, right? So there, that's, a, that's actually equivalent to regular. So being regular is equivalent. So a yellow subdivision is regular if and only if there exists a red dual that satisfies all the, the balancing properties that you want. So balancing is equivalent to existence. So regularity is equivalent to a choice of weights, system of weights that creates balancing. Ah, that's a very good question. The question is, so given a polyhedral complex, um, uh, can I decide algorithmically whether it comes from some variety? Um, so I think the answer is yes. I believe it's decidable in, in the sense of recursion theory, but it's pretty hard, right? So a very, very special case is matroid realizability. Matroid realizability is universal. That's Mioff's theorem that says that if you have any system of polynomial equations whatsoever, you can code it as, as realizability of matroid. So it's at least as hard as this. But I think there's an algorithm, and, and the reason is that you can read off a lot of information from the tropical variety. So for example, you can read off the degree, the dimension. Right? We know the dimension, we know the degree, so from the tropical variety, there's enough information that limits the pot potential varieties. So if you look at the tropical variety, you read off a bunch of invariants, and then you have to hunt for a candidate variety X, but the hunt is narrowed down enough so that uh, you can 
make it into a finite computational problem, decidable problem. So you're hunting in some Hilbert scheme or something like this, but if there is an algorithm, it will be pretty bad. So the question is, what about curves, for example, in three space? Uh, is there a moduli space? Well, first of all, there's a notion of an abstract curve. So just like in moduli theory of, uh, of curves or Riemann surfaces, usually the moduli space refers to an abstract curve. And then a posteriori, you look at embeddings and Hilbert schemes and so on. And, and the situation is analogous here. You have abstract curves and then you have sort of realized curves. And there are spaces and people have studied them at both levels. Um, it's a complicated and very interesting story. I should maybe say um, that tropical geometry is a, has an explosive development. So even at the time of the writing of the book, which is now a couple years ago, I think we covered, you know, 3% of the known topics, right? So we could have easily, you know, written a book that's much, much, much longer. So there's only a tiny of fraction. And since then, you know, many, many more papers have been published. So if you go to the archive and you type in tropical or tropical geometry, the, the literature is vast. And I am certainly not on top of the literature. But this is an active area of research. Um, what can you say about... Uh, the moduli spaces of curves and embedded curves and, and the failure to be realizable. So this is an active topic of study. Okay, thanks for coming. I'll see you on Friday.